Good evening, and welcome to the April 4th evening book talk at Mount Vernon. Of course, I'm not at Mount Vernon. I'm in my dining room on Capitol Hill, uh, but I'm thrilled to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association to this, uh, what's typically a monthly event, our Ford evening book talks, but uh, throughout this uh, this new environment, we'll be having weekly book talks. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to uh, have this evening's uh, talk focus on something that is very important uh, to Mount Vernon's story, and that is the tomb of George Washington, a place where people go uh, to pay homage uh, nearly every time they come to Mount Vernon, which sadly they can't do right now. Um, and we're, we're absolutely thrilled to have Matthew Costello talk to us about his new book on this topic. Uh, but I want—I really want to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Uh, we, this is a an important uh, organization uh, since the 1850s that has rescued Mount Vernon and has been through difficult times in the past. We, of course, know the Civil War, uh, the World War II, uh, and we will weather this challenge together. Uh, thank you so much, Matt, for being with us. Uh, uh, Matt's, by way of introduction, uh, for those who have not had an opportunity to hear from him, uh, is the vice president of the David M. Rubenstein National Center. Uh, for White House History at the White House Historical Association, a PhD from Marquette University, uh, and has actually also spent uh, time as a fellow at the Washington Library at Mount Vernon. Uh, his book, The Property of the Nation, George Washington's Tomb, Mount Vernon, and the Memory of the First President, was published recently by the University Press of Kansas. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before I hand things over to you, and I want you to tell us a, a bit about your, your discoveries in this project, I want to say at the outset that we also have a great opportunity for people to win a free copy of your book tonight. Uh, that is, uh, it, all they have to do is submit a question, either through Facebook or YouTube uh, during this live stream. We'll randomly select a winner off air afterwards. Uh, and, and of course, everyone has an opportunity to buy this book uh, as well. Uh, but one lucky person will walk away a winner uh, simply by submitting a question to this talk. So be thinking as Matt uh, introduces this, uh, uh, this research for us about what you want to ask him. And in the second half of our hour tonight, uh, we'll have an opportunity to ask those questions. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to learning about your book. Thank you so much for having me, Kevin. So uh, why don't you take the stage and uh, tell us what you've discovered? Uh, and I think you've had some images to show us as well. Of course, yeah. Um, so uh, my book project, uh, The Property of the Nation, George Washington's Tomb, Mount Vernon, and the Memory of the First President, uh, really started when I was back in graduate school. And uh, the core of this project actually came out of research I was doing on the construction of the Washington Monument. And one of the questions uh, that came up as I was doing that research was, uh, there was this instance where Congress wanted to move George Washington's body from Mount Vernon to the United States Capitol Rotunda in 1832. It was the centennial of Washington's birth and, uh, and many nationalist leaders, uh, you know, Whig leaders, believed that this would be uh, something that would be beneficial to the nation to move George Washington uh, to be entombed in the city that bore his name. And as I dug deeper, what I found was that they were, this wasn't the first instance, there were multiple attempts to try to move George Washington's body away from Mount Vernon. Uh, so as I shifted my focus to the tombs at Mount Vernon, this is where I discovered that there was this whole, uh, whole another world of people um, you know, who describe themselves as pilgrims, citizens, uh, enslaved and free African-Americans, women who were descending upon the tomb and hoping to learn more about George Washington, his world, but also uh, claiming pieces of his legacy for themselves, sometimes even physically, uh, when they were taking objects from the tomb, removing tree branches. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the presentation. And what I found was that uh, even from the onset, early after Washington passed away, December 14, 1799, uh, Americans clamored for the right to claim him, uh, to remember him as they wished. And this phrase, the property of the nation, kept reappearing in, in 19th century texts where Americans refer to George Washington as the property of the nation and therefore all Americans have a right uh, to commemorate him, to honor him and to claim him. That's fascinating. So why don't we give you an opportunity then uh, to, to, to give us a presentation, show us uh, some of your discoveries and then we'll come back together. Great, sounds good. Okay. So, um, and we can start with the next slide. Uh, unfortunately, our story begins where George Washington's ends. 
Um, he had uh, ridden out on the farm December 12th to observe some of the farming activities. Uh, he was caught in a rainstorm, snowstorm, sleet storm, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and uh, the next day he developed uh, a hoarseness in his throat. Uh, he awoke early in the morning hours, Saturday, December 14th, and uh, he could tell that something wasn't right. He was, he was struggling to breathe. And uh, Martha sent immediately for the overseer, George Rawlings, uh, the family doctor, James Craig, uh, who then uh, Martha called for two more doctors, Gustavus Brown and Elisha Cullen Dick. And between those three doctors and George Rawlings, the overseer, Washington was bled uh, four different times. Uh, he was given uh, uh, calomel, uh, mercury chloride. Uh, he was administered enemas. Uh, uh, he had to gargle different tea sage solutions. None of these things revived Washington's commission. Uh, and between 10 and 11 o'clock at night, he passed away. Uh, the outpouring of grief was remarkable. Uh, here was really the first national figure uh, for the new United States and to lose him really on the cups of the 19th century. Many Americans were curious whether or not, uh, you know, would the country endure? But one of the immediate questions in the aftermath is, well, how do we remember our heroes? And Washington became uh, sort of the test subject for this. You know, how would Americans worship their heroes? Would they follow countries like France or, or England? Or would they develop something different, something unique? Next slide. Now, in the, in the, uh, in the months after Washington's death, uh, Martha Washington received correspondence from all sorts of people. Sometimes you know, these were very sympathetic uh, letters of condolence. And sometimes it was Americans who were asking for different pieces of George Washington, quite literally pieces. Uh, this is a, a shot of a locket uh, of Washington's hair and a piece of the Hessian flag from Trenton. Uh, so uh, this was one example, uh, and I have this image in the book because uh, there were actually uh, several letters that were sent into Martha Washington asking for pieces of George Washington's hair. Next slide. Now, Beyond asking for physical pieces of Washington, Americans wanted to know where would George Washington be buried? Now in his will, he was very clear. He wanted to be buried at Mount Vernon, and he also wanted a new tomb to be built near the vineyard enclosure. Uh, but that took about 30 years to actually complete. But uh, this design, this was actually done by the famed English trained architect, Benjamin Henry Latrobe. Uh, this is, almost has the form of a, a, a pyramidal mausoleum. And there were some questions uh, within Congress whether or not this was something that George Washington would have actually approved of. Uh, there are comparisons where they're saying that George Washington was not a pharaoh, he was not an emperor, he was not a king. Uh, and the interesting thing is uh, you know, this is happening right amidst the transition of power between Federalists and Democratic Republicans, uh, who very much channel a different type of hero worship that really Americans should be coming together to commemorate many different people who contributed independence instead of lionizing one singular figure. Next slide. Now, after Martha Washington passes away, it's George Washington's nephew, uh, Supreme Court Associate Justice Bushrod Washington, who inherits the estate. Uh, George and Martha never had children, uh, so the estate passes to Bushrod Washington, and he's actually the first uh, relative who has the question posed to him, um, would you be willing to move George Washington's body? And uh, he actually declines. He says that he reads his, his uncle's will and it's pretty clear that he wants to be buried at Mount Vernon. Um, now before this, Martha had actually agreed, uh, Congress had sent resolutions to her uh, about moving George Washington's body in the future and she uh, acquiesced to it so long as she could be moved with him. Uh, so that was sort of put on the back burner, but in 1799, 1800, Martha Washington had given approval. However, the Capitol Rotunda wasn't gonna be done until the 1820s. So it was gonna be a while before this could actually take place. In the meantime, there were repeated attempts. And with Bushrod Washington, it was actually the state of Virginia who wanted to move his body to Richmond. Next slide. Now, when that doesn't happen, uh, the family decides to build a new tomb, the one that you visit today when you go to Mount Vernon. It was completed in 1830, 31. Uh, this uh, picture is actually from right around 1834. It doesn't quite look uh, like the tomb you know today. And that's because in the 1830s, it was encased in brick. 
Uh, and then later, uh, when they added the sarcophagi, uh, they actually enclosed it uh, with the Victorian brick archway in the late 1830s. So it was a little bit different. Next slide. Now the last private owner of Mount Vernon uh, was this man, John Augustin Washington III. And uh, he took a different approach. Now, most of the Washington relatives before him had really tried to avoid uh, interacting with people. They thought they were a nuisance, they were strangers, they were trespassers. In fact, Bushrod Washington goes so far as to bar steamboats from landing at Mount Vernon. John Augustine Washington III has a very different approach to this. And he decides that if these people are gonna come, there's really no way to stop them. So why not try to find some way to profit off this? Uh, and, and really sort of developing an early form of historical tourism. He enters into a contract uh, with the uh, Washington and Alexandria Steamboat Company. Uh, so now they can directly land people at Mount Vernon uh, at the wharf so they could go up to the tomb and see the house. Uh, he starts selling things on site. Uh, he enters into a contract agreement with a man in Washington, D.C. to produce Washington mementos and trinkets. Uh, so he has a, a much more open door policy to letting people interact with Washington's world. And in fact, many of these things then get embraced later by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association of the Union. Next slide. In fact, one of the instances I found uh, because uh, John Augustine Washington III's farm diaries and farm books are actually at uh, the Washington Library, he actually had a plank, a wooden plank walkway made uh, to go from the wharf all the way up to the new tomb. And he built the labor and the materials, uh, his enslaved workers, their labor and the materials to the steamboat company. Uh, and the company was willing to pay it. Uh, and later on, he renegotiates his contract with them where he starts receiving about 25% of ticket sales. So uh, he, he was a very uh, smart entrepreneurial businessman. Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't, just wasn't enough for him to to avoid having to sell the estate uh, later to the ladies. Next slide. Here's actually a handbill. Uh, so you can see uh, these were the types of things that were handed out to people. And uh, you know these companies, if they wanted to get people to sign up uh, to go down and see George Washington's Mount Vernon, uh, it wasn't a picture of the house. It was a picture of the tomb. The tomb was the primary attraction in the 19th century. And the reason that was, was because the house was still privately owned. People still lived in it. And, uh, you know, how would you feel if you constantly had people knocking at your door or peering into your window and they wanted to talk about maybe one of your deceased relatives? You probably wouldn't like it very much either. So the tomb was really the primary attraction because really anybody could access it. The steamboats, uh, carriages, omnibuses, all these things made it more accessible. And uh, with John Augustine Washington III, he wanted more people to come and experience Mount Vernon in person. Next slide. Now, he also uh, engaged in, in business practices that not everybody agreed upon. Uh, one of those ventures was with a man named James Crutchett, uh, who he was, he was an Englishman. He is probably more well known for his work on the Capitol building, installing gas lighting at the Capitol. But he actually had this, uh, this short-lived business in Washington, D.C., where he entered into an agreement with John Augustine Washington III. He brought wood from the Mount Vernon estate, and he had these types of things made out of Mount Vernon wood. Uh, pictured in front of you, you have uh, one of the metals, and of course, the images of the tomb. It's not of the house. And accompanying this, next slide, was of course a certificate of authenticity. So uh, you would have a little bit of poetry about George Washington. You would have a statement from John Augustine Washington III below that, uh, and also from the mayor of Washington DC attesting to the character of all the parties. And uh, in part of that statement, he actually says uh, that this, a portion of the wood that was sold uh, is from the same hill where the tomb resides at Mount Vernon. Uh, when I looked at the farm books, I actually found out that he was right, a portion, but a very small portion. A lot of the wood came from other parts of the estate. Uh, what I found most interesting is that a lot of it came from along the shoreline, uh, what is today uh, more near the Pioneer Farm. Uh, and in Washington's time, he referred to this area as Hellhole. Uh, and he called it Hellhole because he nothing would grow there. Uh, it seemed like everything was dead. 
uh, and he just wasn't having any success. The wood was very brittle. So I, I did. I, I found that kind of amusing that John Augustine Washington III uh, was able to use some of that wood, repurpose some of that wood uh, for a George Washington memorabilia business. Next slide. So there were politics in moving Washington's body. Uh, there was, of course, economics playing into it. Uh, people were profiting off historical tourism. They were profiting off the memory of Washington. And even though his family did try to resist it at first, inevitably, uh, John Augustine Washington III felt like it was the only way to really kind of keep things moving and keep the estate going in the 1850s. So then I started to ask the question, well, who was actually speaking with all these people? You know, who, who is actually talking to these hundreds who are visiting every week? You know, the newspaper accounts say that steamboats are bringing hundreds of people every week. So who's actually talking to these people? And what I discovered was that for the most part, the storytellers on site in the 19th century were enslaved African-Americans. Now, uh, some of them uh, claimed that they were Washington's last servant. Uh, and I talk about that more in the book. There's, there's a number of them that claim to be the last servant. Uh, but we know that Washington uh, freed the slaves that he owned in his own right. Uh, and certainly some did stay near the estate. Uh, and, you know, William Lee stayed on the estate until he passed away and he was freed outright in the will. Uh, but Bushrod Washington would have brought a whole new transplanted enslaved community into Mount Vernon. And there would have been a mixture of these two different groups of people. So there is some continuity in how these stories are told, um, but there's also differences. And what's fascinating is that African-Americans were also claiming Washington's memory as well. Uh, you know, it wasn't just white visitors or, or affluent citizens or politicians, but that African-Americans were playing a very prominent role in the 19th century as well, talking about George Washington to visitors to Mount Vernon. Next slide. Now, uh, I'm showing you sort of a, a smaller image because that's actually the front page of uh, sheet music, uh, Washington's Tomb Ballad. And, uh, and to the right, you have sort of a blown up uh, shot as well, so you can see. And uh, if you look at the front of the tomb, you can see there's an African-American man uh, sitting to the side and there's a number of canes uh, leaning against the tomb. Now, the Washington cane actually became a very popular uh, means of people commemorating Washington. Uh, it was a way to show your social status to be able to have something like this. And uh, oftentimes there were gifts. People were giving these Washington canes to other people. Um, and, and what I found particularly interesting about this one is that it coincides with a lot of the accounts that I found where people talk about purchasing canes from African-Americans, from enslaved people at Mount Vernon. And oftentimes, they were given gratuities, they were given tips. Uh, so there was definitely an exchange of goods and services that was happening. Now, how much John Augustus Washington III knew about these things? I mean, certainly he was probably aware. Uh, he does actually start taking shares of sales uh, from the garden later in the 1850s. But early on, uh, my guess is that it was probably one of those things where he just wanted people not to harass the family. Next slide. Here, and I, I really like this image as well because, you know, it wasn't just enslaved men. Uh, I found instances of enslaved women uh, who were telling stories about Washington coming back from the revolution um, and also enslaved children. Uh, there were a number of instances where enslaved children were uh, serving as tour guides of sorts. Uh, in this particular image, you can see there's a, an affluent gentleman standing to the side of the tomb and what looks like a young African-American boy peering into the enclosure. And you can tell by the shadow, he's holding up a walking stick. Next slide. Now this image is actually from uh, 1870. It's of a man named Jim Mitchell. Uh, and he, uh, among many by then formerly enslaved African-Americans, uh, you know, either stuck around or lived near Mount Vernon or continued to work for Mount Vernon as free men uh, for the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Uh, but I like this particular image because again, you can see in the background, walking sticks. Next slide. Okay, so that, that covers storytelling on the ground, but what about in terms of like things like plays or poetry or biographies? How were people talking about George Washington? 
Well, as it turns out, uh, his step grandson, George Washington Park Custis, uh, you know, he was a, a big player in this. I think people immediately think of uh, Mason Locke Weems, you know, writing the life of Washington and how many editions uh, were repeated over and over again and talking about cherry trees and, and, and all those things. But George Washington Park Custis, because of his connection to his step grandfather, his recollections became very powerful in the 1850s. He really saw himself as sort of the, the publicist for the Washington family. And uh, I always found it pretty remarkable that in his recollections, he is the one who uh, recalls a conversation with Martha Washington as she's ailing, saying that she still wanted to be buried in the Capitol with George Washington. Uh, so he sort of stirs the pot a little bit more with this. And, uh, and the Augusta Washingtons uh, and, and Bushrod Washington really felt that you know, George Washington wanted to be buried at Mount Vernon. That's what he said in his will, and that's, that's it. Uh, he, he was very much uh, a man who should be on his property, and in a way, his remains uh, should remain his family's property. But George Washington Park Custis had other ideas. Next slide. So beyond the materials of people like Mason Locke Weems and George Washington Park Custis, what about visually? How were people experiencing the tomb in the 19th century? Yes, it was more accessible. It was more readily available than ever before. But you know, most people weren't going to be able to take the time to go visit Mount Vernon. But instead, uh, starting in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, leading up to the Civil War, that's when we see this explosion of, of print culture. And it, it's going to be paintings, engravings, illustrations, uh, daguerreotypes, uh, uh, all different types of imagery for people to be able to see and experience Washington's tomb from wherever they are. Um, and, and this particular one is uh, it's by John Hill after Joshua Shaw, 1820-21. Next slide. Now, what's interesting as we as we push later into the mid 19th century, a lot of these things sort of take on the same feel as the Hudson River School, where you know the image is always being framed by nature. It's showing the abundance and bounty of the United States, uh, and really, you know, the artist lets you know what the focal point is, um, and it's usually not people. Uh, so, in this particular instance, we have this side shot, but it's of the new tomb. Uh, and you can see kind of in the background, covered by trees mostly, is the mansion. Uh, so again, in the 19th century, the focal point in terms of, uh, of Washington's memory and popular culture was the tomb. It, it was the tomb, not the house, because the tomb was the important part. Next slide. Again, you'll see this uh, in painting as well. Uh, this is a painting uh, done by William Matthew Pryor in 1850. Again, you can see the emphasis being placed in the foreground on the tomb uh, and the nature around it, the rustic uh, setting of it. And the house is just sort of in the distance uh, and you don't really get a sense of it. Uh, you don't get a sense of the house really at all, but the tomb really seems to have uh, the focus of it. Next slide. So finally, then I turn my attention to the actual visitors. So who were these people? Uh, and Early on, it was generally people who were wealthier, uh, affluent Americans, uh, but there were also very interesting uh, trips by uh, foreign visitors, uh, you know, British, French, uh, later uh, with uh, Hungarian nationalist Laudius Kosuth, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette. Uh, you, you see this, it's a list of notable figures who always find a way to get to the tomb, and they often refer to it as a pilgrimage, a paying tribute to the father of uh, the, the United States, uh, the father of freedom, liberty, and uh, and that language, you know, saying that they're coming for a pilgrimage and that they were pilgrims. Uh, well, that, of course, then also, I think, helped rationalize the idea of taking relics. And uh, it's a little bit different than how we think about uh, commercialism and objects and historic sites today. But in the 19th century, these things were seen as having somewhat sacred proportions to them. So something as what seems as, as uh, you know, ordinary as a stone, a pebble, a stick, a flower, all of a sudden became a relic when people took them from near the tomb. I found uh, a number of instances where people were actually sawing tree limbs uh, from the trees above the tomb. Uh, there was one instance where a man uh, 
shoveled three barrels full of dirt. He wanted to take uh, some of George Washington's land home with him. Uh, I don't know if he, he did it to sell it. He might have. Um, but he wanted to take sacred soil home with him. Um, and, uh, and the enslaved population is part of this as well because they start selling these things. They start selling bouquets of flowers. They start selling fruit uh, from the upper garden. Uh, so it, it's fascinating to see how these different uh, people are viewing uh, what they're doing, what these rituals mean. For visitors, they see it as their right uh, to, to visit George Washington's tomb, to pay homage, uh, but also to take something to remember him by. And the Washington family does not feel that way. They, they feel like these people are trespassers and this is vandalism. You know, they're destroying the estate. Uh, and it is, you know, it plays into the reason why the estate looks the way it does by the 1850s. Uh, and it's because you know, visitors uh, oftentimes are taking things, they're carving their initials on things. Um, it's a very different approach to a historic site that certainly we wouldn't do today, uh, but they didn't see it the same way. It wasn't a historic site. It was a lived site. Uh, and it was something that they wanted to take a piece home with them. Next slide. This is actually a piece uh, of George Washington's coffin. Uh, so th I also found these instances where people tried to get in the tomb. They, they wanted uh, actual pieces of the coffin. And, uh, you know, Washington was originally buried. He, he was put in a lead lined coffin, deposited into another coffin, a mahogany coffin, um, I believe. And, uh, and then he was placed in the old tomb. When they moved him to the new tomb, uh, they had to put him into a new coffin. Uh, so he was still in the lead lined coffin, then put into a new coffin. And then when he was moved to the sarcophagus, they had to take him out of that and put the lead lined coffin in the marble sarcophagus. So there were coffins that belonged to George Washington that housed his remains that immediately took on sort of these pseudo religious sacred uh, connotations. And people were, were willing to go into the old tomb and look for bits and pieces of coffin. Now, they probably didn't know that at one point there were 22 Washington family members entombed in the old tomb uh, and just grabbing any piece of wood. I mean, odds are it probably wasn't George Washington's coffin, but they believed it and they purported to believe it. Next slide. Here's a picture of, uh, of the marble sarcophagus that you'd see today if you peered into the new enclosure. Uh, and it's a really fascinating story. Uh, there were two men in Philadelphia uh, named John Struthers uh, uh, was one of them. And then William Strickland was actually the one who designed it. Uh, Struthers was the marble mason who, who built it. And uh, they offered to create this marble sarcophagus for George Washington. And what's really fascinating about these two men, and uh, I didn't get to mention it earlier, but you know the Freemasons are also very much invested and involved in this. Uh, in fact, during the 1820s, there is a campaign by some of the state lodges to raise money to build a Masonic monument to entomb George Washington at Mount Vernon. Now it doesn't actually come to fruition, uh, but the Freemasons are, are, are sort of always, they're always in the picture. Uh, they're there. William Eaton's there building the new tomb. He's a Freemason. Uh, he comes back to do some of the brickwork. Um, and then, of course, you have Struthers and, uh, and Strickland, who are also Masons. Uh, so the Masons may not have uh, Washington entombed in a Masonic monument, but they're very much involved uh, in commemorating him uh, in the annual events, uh, but then also even putting these bits and pieces together at his actual tomb. Now, when they remove George Washington's body and they, they remove the rest of the Washington family members, they bring them to the new tomb, uh, which was that early version I showed you that didn't have the enclosure. Now, according to William Strickland's account, uh, when they brought the sarcophagus down, uh, it, didn't, it didn't quite fit through that doorway uh, to go into the inner vault. So what they decided to do was build that enclosure over the top of it. And, and that's part of the reason why George and Martha's sarcophagi are outside the tomb, uh, with it, at least based on Strickland's account, um, part of it had to do with measuring. Next slide. So where does this leave us in the 1850s? Well, John Augustine Washington III is, is still really trying to keep things moving. He has some money coming in from historical tourism, but it's, re it's not enough to suffice. And uh, and, and based on visitor damage, visitor vandalism, you know, the estate is not looking any better. 
And uh, he approaches both the federal government and the state of Virginia and, and asks either one of them if they would be willing to purchase Mount Vernon. And it seems like one is only interested when the other, when they find out the other one is contemplating action. Uh, and then it seems like there's back and forth, uh, but then it, nothing comes to fruition. So it's actually a private individual, a private citizen, and Pamela Cunningham, uh, who makes this, this call to arms, um, call to raise funds, really, uh, in, uh, in the 1850s. And uh, what I find so fascinating about her is that uh, her evolution uh, of thinking about Washington's memory and, and who should be the guardians of legacy. Uh, when she puts out this call, you know, Aunt, Aunt Pamela makes this call to the women of the South. And what she realizes over time is that in order for this movement to succeed, in order for them to raise the funds, it, this needs to be a national movement. And, and even though that is not a, that's not a popular sentiment uh, with some of her, her supporters, she does it anyway. Uh, and I think that's ultimately that's what makes it successful uh, is that she she knows that, uh, you know, to to use the same phrase that 19th century Americans are using, Washington is the property of the nation. Then we need a national organization of women to get the job done. And, uh, you know, Congress couldn't do it. Uh, the Virginia General Assembly couldn't do it. But it was these women uh, who banded together. Uh, who raised money, who, who sold miniature Gilbert Stewart portraits, who uh, sold subscriptions to the Mount Vernon record, uh, who were able to raise the funds, um, and also from speaking tours, uh, people from like Edward Everett, uh, they were able to raise the money uh, so that they could purchase Mount Vernon from John Augustine Washington III. Uh, it was a hefty asking price. It was $200,000, and, uh, and at that time, uh, they signed the contract, even though, you know, John Augustine Washington, he really resisted. He wanted to sell it to uh, a government entity. He, he thought that uh, selling to some type of private organization would, you know, people would construe that as he was only out for money. Uh, but the reality was that, you know, neither the federal government or the state of Virginia uh, could, uh, could get it to get their acts together to do it. And uh, when he turns over the property to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, the Union, in 1860, uh, you know, they inherit uh, what is probably the most uh, visited uh, historical tourist destination in the United States at that time. And immediately uh, they have to protect it. Next slide. So they they start a policy. Um, that, the, you know, Mount Vernon will essentially be a place of neutrality. And uh, if soldiers want to come visit, then that's fine. But they're supposed to lay down their arms, which uh, it looks like this particular in, uh, image, uh, not everybody followed. Uh, but they're supposed to they're supposed to visit as citizens. And, uh, you know, the, the fear is that what if the federal government confiscates this property? Uh, you know, something similar had happened with Arlington House, where a lot of Washington relics and letters and possessions had been taken by the federal government. Uh, so, you know, the question then becomes, well, we have to be neutral, right? We, we, we have to be neutral to both sides. Next slide. So part of uh, Ann Pamela Cunningham's strategy, she's actually back in South Carolina. She gets uh, sort of stuck behind the lines uh, as the war starts and unfolds. And she decides to put Sarah Tracy uh, from New York in charge of the property, along with this man to the right, Upton Herbert, who was actually uh, uh, someone that John Augustus Washington III knew, and he recommended to be the first superintendent of the property. So then you have a pairing of a Northerner, a Southerner, um, and uh, a New Yorker and a Virginian, and that this, again, was supposed to demonstrate that the ladies uh, were neutral, and that Mount Vernon was neutral, and George Washington was neutral. Next slide. So what do we take away from all this? Well, uh, I, I think one of the things that I learned was that Americans did try to go down this course of hero worship as defined by worshiping bodily remains. And that George Washington was the test case because he was, he was really, he was the ideal uh, for that time period. But it ultimately failed. Uh, you know, Washington 
stayed buried at Mount Vernon. Uh, he was never moved. Uh, and this country never really had a national site of repose until Arlington National Cemetery was created. I mean, there was Congressional Cemetery before that, uh, but you know, nothing like Westminster Abbey, nothing like the National Pantheon in France. Uh, we decided that we were gonna do hero worship very differently. Uh, that it wasn't just gonna be about bodily remains, but it was gonna be about paying homage, uh, but also trying to emulate and try to learn uh, and reflect upon their example. Um, and I think the other thing is that, uh, you know, I've often thought about, well, what would Washington have thought of his legacy? Um, and what would he have thought of all of this? And how would he would have wanted to be remembered? Um, you know, I, I took a look at his will and, uh, and the wills of several other prominent founding fathers. And in Washington's will, he says, I, George Washington of Mount Vernon, citizen of the United States, and lately president of the same. But if you look at Thomas Jefferson, if you look at Alexander Hamilton, you look at James Madison, they all identify themselves by their locality. Uh, they say, uh, Thomas Jefferson of Monticello, uh, Albemarle County, uh, James Madison, Orange County, Alexander Hamilton, New York City. Uh, but I, I think Washington's is so fascinating. Uh, citizen of the United States and formerly president of I mean, I think that's how he wanted to be remembered. He wanted to be remembered as an American, uh, as someone who tried to do everything he could to help his country. And, uh, and I think, you know, looking back on it, even though there was much debate and, and, uh, and discord in the 19th century, uh, I think he, he was successful. Now, uh, just real quickly before we jump into questions, I did want to at least point out a few things. Um, so if you go online uh, to Mount Vernon's website, they do have a virtual tour of the estate. Uh, so even though the estate is closed and you can't visit these sites, uh, even though I've, I've, I've talked a lot about visiting Washington's tomb and now you can't, uh, you can uh, by doing it virtually. And, uh, and this is actually the old tomb uh, that I referenced uh, Washington would have been buried here uh, when he died in 1799. Uh, he was later moved in 1831 to the new tomb. Uh, and if you, you click on one of the points of interest, uh, you'll get a pop-up and it'll tell you a little bit more about the space. As you can see, it's not very big. Uh, the old tomb was only about 12 by seven by six. It was actually quite cramped. Uh, but at one point there were 22 Washington family members uh, inside that old tomb. Now, if we go out of this, we can actually go up to the new tomb. And here, I just wanna highlight uh, a few things. Of course, right in front of us, we have the enclosure uh, with the marble uh, sarcophagi. And, uh, and this will tell you a little bit more what I alluded to uh, earlier that uh, Washington was moved and he was entombed here in 1831 and he hasn't been moved since. And then if we close that and we look to the left, over here, uh, I mentioned some of the graffiti. Uh, Civil War soldiers actually uh, did quite a bit of this graffiti as well. Um, and what I argue in the book is that they were quite literally leaving their mark. Uh, they were claiming Washington uh, in, in honor of what they were fighting for, what they believed in. And then if we close that, uh, the final one I wanted to point out uh, over there by the bush. Um, and this pop-up, uh, this is actually a photograph of a man named Thomas Bushrod. Thomas Bushrod uh, was the tomb guardian uh, up and in, up into the 20th century. And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier about how enslaved African-Americans uh, were really the storytellers in Mount Vernon. And in fact, uh, often enough, uh, you know, some of them actually lived at the estate longer than some of the new heirs of the property. So, uh, they actually knew quite a bit about the land, the landscape, uh, how things had changed. And, uh, you know, this was actually, he was actually in a line of African-Americans uh, who guarded the tomb, uh, actually starting all the way back uh, with Edmund Parker, who was a tomb guardian really for about 34 years until he died in 1898. Uh, but this continued in the 20th century, uh, where African-Americans were really seen as the, as the primary caretakers and storytellers at Mount Vernon. Matt, this is fascinating. 
thank you so much. I, I, I walk by that tomb. Well, I don't uh, in the last five weeks, but I walk by that tomb regularly and I feel like I, I've learned a lot about its history. Uh, so thanks. Uh, let, let me actually uh, uh, go right into audience questions because they have been pouring in. Uh, and Scarlett asked the one that I would otherwise have asked, uh, which is what first drew you to this topic? What first drew you to studying George Washington uh, and particularly Mount Vernon and his final resting place? So I remember visiting Mount Vernon when I was about eight years old. And uh, obviously a lot's changed since then. Um, and I, I had actually gotten pulled into that world by Washington, but I, I was actually at first interested in uh, his intelligence operations. So spycraft and, uh, and, and if I'm sure many people have seen Turn. I mean, that was, that was kind of the stuff I was into before Turn was a show. Um, but after a while, I, I just became really interested in uh, these sort of like these, you know, George Washington's birthday celebration and uh, the order of toasts. And what are they toasting? Why are they toasting this thing or that thing? And as it turned out, you know, I just became fascinated in the idea of studying things like monuments because you know, monuments, you have to ask those questions. Well, when was it designed? Who designed it? Who paid for it? Why is it placed there? Uh, who does annual celebrations around it? What type of history are they trying to convey? Uh, I just find those questions fascinating. And, uh, you know, we can still ask those questions today about monuments, uh, but you really have to get back to the root of it and, and try to figure out who Washington really was during his life uh, so that you can fully understand his legacy and why his legacy is the way it is. That's right. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the things I should r remind our audience, some of whom may have joined after the introduction, uh, obviously uh, this is a, a new book and it's, it's one that, that people can purchase uh, and we can help them find the way to do it. But also uh, one lucky person will get to uh, take home a free copy of this book or have delivered to them, as we all do everything these days, uh, a free copy of this book uh, simply by submitting a question. Uh, so it's uh, to Facebook or YouTube. Uh, and and they are coming in. Uh, next, actually, uh, we have another question um, uh, from someone I think you know, uh, Stuart McLaurin. Sounds like maybe someone you, you, you see, well, you used to see daily, uh, who works uh, with you at the White House Historical Association. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the uh, your experience as a fellow at the Washington Library. Uh, again, probably a question I would have asked anyway. Uh, how did your time in Mount Vernon, some of the images you showed us, by the way, that uh, were um, uh, courtesy of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association are absolutely stunning. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your research experiences uh, here at Mount Vernon. I mean, I couldn't have I couldn't have written the book uh, the way that I did in, in the time that I did uh, if I hadn't had the support of Mount Vernon through the fellowship program. And uh, if you've never been to the Washington Library, I hope it opens soon so people can make an appointment and go see it. But just an incredible array of, of manuscripts, books, uh, period related sources, images. Uh, in fact, Kevin, you brought up the images uh, from my PowerPoint. Uh, I think pretty much all but two of them. Uh, are from the Mount Vernon uh, holdings. So it just goes to show you some of the incredible materials that that place has. And I think the library's uh, embrace of really uh, promoting young scholars, helping them get the funding that they need to complete their dissertations, to complete their book projects. I mean, it was incredibly beneficial to me. And, uh, and I think that's something that Mount Vernon should be really proud of. That's great. And we look forward to having you back as soon as we can open our doors, uh, which hopefully will be soon. Uh, and you can uh, come back to the Washington Library soon. Uh, let's go to another audience question. Uh, Daniel Shippey, uh, who's been, uh, by the way, a regular participant on our, our uh, video uh, feed, both in the daytime and in these evenings. Uh, he asked a question that I, I, I wouldn't have thought to ask. And I, I'm fascinated to hear what you think uh, the answer might be. Uh, we see all this 19th century graffiti uh, in and around Mount Vernon or places like Mount Vernon. Uh, where people are making leaving their mark. Um, mm -hmm. When did a shift occur uh, in, in in people's minds about uh, not doing that, uh, about uh, uh, protecting and and preserving as sacred these spaces as opposed to leaving a mark or even taking a part of it home with them? Any mm -hmm. idea? Yeah, I mean, certainly with the historic preservation movement in the nineteenth century, uh, I think people were starting to become more mindful of it. But really, it's not until historic sites, I think, really start enforcing those things. So if it's roping off areas, if it's putting up barricades, uh, I think that tends to deter people a lot more. 
Um, but you know, I, I still hear these stories of, uh, you know, not too long ago, I remember reading a, a newspaper article about a couple of Americans who were caught engraving their initials at the Colosseum in Rome. So, uh, you know, these types of things still happen. Um, one of the ones I remember recently was, uh, I think Mount Vernon had done some restoration work up in the, in the cupola and, uh, they had found, uh, initials, uh, in some of the woodwork up there as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when exactly people stopped doing it, um, I mean, I couldn't pinpoint a date or a year, uh, but I do think that it, it became more and more of a taboo, uh, in the 20th century. Um, I would think probably 1950s onward, then it really became, you know, you were really kind of stepping out of line doing something like that. Uh, there were probably instances before that, but, um, you know, 19th century Americans just didn't see these things, these objects, the same way that we do. And probably, I, probably I if, we had any of the, if we had any of the interpretation staff that that uh, helped tour us through the grounds at Mount Vernon, we'd hear stories. Uh, if they were with us right now, I'm sure they'd tell us that there are still times where they have to dissuade or uh, prevent. Uh, but uh, but certainly, you're right. There's a shift at some point, and it happens seems to happen uh, uh, later than than we might think particularly for a place that Americans, as you say, found sacred from such an early date. Uh, but part of that sacred uh, uh, approach that they that they uh, brought to the space uh, led them to want to bring part of it home with them. That's right. a, a fascinating part of the story. Um, okay, so uh, Colleen Shogun, also I believe someone you work with, um, <laughs> uh, is uh, how are we supposed to think about Washington's complex legacy as the father of our Republican democracy? Uh, but also as an owner of enslaved people. Uh, this, is, this is something, uh, and let me actually uh, uh, pursue this a bit with you. Uh, it, part of the the memory of Washington and the complexity of the memory of Washington is, of course, that uh, the nation begins to divide on regional lines in these areas, um, uh, on this, uh, particularly on this theme of, of slavery and the need to abolish it. Uh, how did it shape um, the, the memory of Washington in the period that you studied in the 19th century? And uh, how are we supposed to think about that complexity today? So uh, what I've always found fascinating is that, you know, Washington was, uh, I, I believe, the only uh, slave owning founding father figure who freed the enslaved people he owned outright in his will. And nobody talks about that in the 19th century uh, or, or very few people. And, you know, I think part of the reason is that, you know, citizens don't want Washington to be remembered as an emancipator. They want him to be remembered as a founding father, as a president, as a general. There are other, so many things that Washington was that those things get elevated over something like emancipator. And, uh, you know, I did find instances where there were enslaved storytellers who would make references to, uh, you know, Washington freeing his slaves and, um, uh, somebody would ask them, are you enslaved? And they would say, well, uh, if I was George Washington's, I would be free. Um, so, I mean, there are these stories of, uh, of people uh, really being presented with this history on site at Mount Vernon, uh, but it seems like that's not really part of the written biographies. It's not really part of the wider pop culture references to George Washington. It's not something that really becomes, I think, more well-known until the 20th century. And, now we have to find this balance between, you know, can we be critical of George Washington, but can we also still admire him? And, and I think we can. You know, he was flawed like anyone else. Um, the times he lived in had uh, systems of oppression and prejudice. Um, and over the course of his lifetime, he, his thinking on slavery changed. And uh, he had become a slave owner at age 11. Uh, by the end of his life, uh, there were 317 enslaved people at Mount Vernon, uh, 123 he owned in his own right, and he decided to free those people. And, you know, I don't think anybody should be, uh, you know, held to one particular point of view for their entire life if, if they change their thinking on something. Uh, and certainly that was the direction the country was heading in. I mean, I think Washington, probably one of his best attributes is his foresight. And I think he thought it was immoral, it was economically inefficient, and I think he thought that it would be the death of the union at some point. Um, so he did what he could. That's right. Um, I, I think we, we have so many questions. I wanna I keep moving forward. And 
Uh, one uh, question that we have coming in from uh, Mary Gomez uh, is asking about the sources for, for your own research. Uh, she mentions diaries, doctor's dictations, probably in, in your description of Washington's final hours, mm -hmm. uh, correspondence. Could you describe a little bit of the breadth of materials that you found uh, necessary to write this book? Well, there's quite a bit at the Washington Library in, tombs, uh, in terms of uh, different visitor accounts of tomb experiences, uh, but I also found quite a bit in uh, you know, digital newspapers, periodicals. Um, but then I would also say, and these are actually great resources. I, I don't even know if anybody's really dug into these uh, much beyond what I've done and what Scott Casper has done. But John Augustine Washington III's farm books are very detailed uh, in terms of where he's going, uh, you know, his business dealings, what type of work is being done on the estate in the 1840s and 1850s. Uh, all that is quite fascinating. For the medical treatment, uh, Tobias Lear has an account of Washington's last illness uh, that I relied on, as well as some other scholarship. There's been obviously one of the one of the more interesting topics. People want to know, you know, what really killed George Washington, and uh, you know, the recent studies have concluded that it was probably acute epiglottitis. Uh, but then the next question becomes, well, was it viral or was it bacterial? Because uh, if it was viral you know, maybe uh, bleeding Washington so much is actually what killed him because then you're also removing white blood cells to fight infection. If it's bacterial, well, there are no antibiotics. So uh, it doesn't matter what you do, Washington will succumb to that illness. And, uh, and what I've always kind of been curious about is whether or not if it was bacterial, uh, where could that have been infection started? Uh, I've always thought maybe his dentures uh, because if the infection started in his throat uh, it's, it, and it's bacterial, it's not very far-fetched to think uh, it could reach the back of his throat and his larynx. Hmm. We have a, a question coming in also as well about what might have been buried with Washington or uh, you mentioned, by the way, his dentures. Uh, that's a question I've, ne I've never thought to ask of whether he was buried with his dentures. Uh, did he have any objects buried with them? Do we know what he was wearing? Is any records of these kinds of things in the, in the description of, of his burial? Well, I know that he was he was buried in uh, what are called grave clothes, uh, which is more sort of like a, a tightly wound uh, sheet or garment. Uh, so it, it wasn't like a, a uniform or anything like that. But this would have been standard uh, for affluent people in the 18th century to be buried in grave clothes. Uh, he was put out in the new room uh, and, and he was very clear he wanted to make sure uh, that he was dead uh, because people in the 18th century had this this terrible fear of being buried alive. So, well, most people, people have that fear of being yeah. buried alive. Yeah, most people do. Um, but, it, but it was always very direct, you know, make sure you leave my body out for three days to make sure I'm fully dead. Um, and then dress me uh, and, and bury me. And for Washington, he was uh, dressed in grave clothes. He was placed in the lead line casket. And then uh, I believe a mahogany casket made in Alexandria. Um, as far as I know, were there any objects in there? Not that I remember seeing. Uh, is it possible that Washington family members put things in there and they didn't record it? Perhaps. Um, but I, not that I recall seeing, no. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question uh, that it's a little bit about the, uh, um, the sort of memento mori that you described, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the locks of hair and, and things mm -hmm. that uh, uh, people would keep, have as keepsakes from, uh, from the, the body of Washington. Uh, was there anything else uh, requested besides hair? Um, there is this question, teeth with four question marks. Uh, that seems uh, uh, unlikely, but uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you answer it. What, what else might people have been asking uh, for as uh, objects for, uh, um, a, uh, for their own um, sacred uh, sort of artifact? So uh, a couple examples come to mind. Um, there was one man who asked for one of Washington's uh, suits because he wanted to have a model wear it and then he was going to paint a full length portrait of George Washington. Uh, there was another man who asked uh, if Martha would be willing to sign off on publishing her husband's correspondence for a book, uh, an almanac on agriculture. Uh, there was another group, uh, a group of women who actually said that their father served with Washington during the revolution and they were desiring locks of hair uh, to wear as lockets. Uh, but probably the most interesting one, there was a man uh, who wrote this very long letter to Martha Washington, and uh, he essentially uh, says that he's been falsely imprisoned 
and uh, he served with Washington. Uh, he was an honorable man like Washington, and he was really hoping that Martha uh, would write to the governor of Pennsylvania and ask for a pardon on his behalf. Uh, he had been accidentally accused of stealing a horse. And uh, as far as I can tell, Martha did not uh, did not reply to that request. No. Uh, you, you, in your presentation, talked about the Civil War years, uh, and uh, uh, one question that's coming in uh, that asks you to follow up a bit on this, uh, and I wonder if you could talk to us ab about uh, the kinds of respects that soldiers uh, from both sides, uh, Adam asked about Union troops, but uh, you could also speak to uh, Confederate troops. What do we know about the, the kind of homage that they paid? What sort of uh, records and, and stories do they leave behind? Yeah, so, um, you know, certainly so, uh, soldiers from both sides uh, visited Mount Vernon at different times throughout the course of the war, you know, really depending on sort of the movements and the pickets surrounding Mount Vernon. Um, but it, what, what I found was fascinating is that there's actually this rumor early on that uh, Confederates have stolen Washington's body. And it sets off this panic. Uh, and Sarah Tracy has to immediately step forward and think of it as sort of like issuing a press release, <laughs> you know, uh, that this is ridiculous. Uh, Washington is in his tomb as he's been, uh, you know, the rules of neutrality <laughs> are still enforced. And, uh, and then people who visit the tomb afterwards then publish accounts and they say, oh, you know, everything appears to be fine and Washington hasn't been moved. And, but it was fascinating because uh, I think it even goes as high as to General Winfield Scott who uh, issues an order about uh, the rebels who are trampling the Constitution are also trampling the ashes of George Washington. Uh, so, so, you know, very uh, visceral, powerful language. And what I talk about more in the book is that really during the Civil War, there were two George Washingtons. There was a George Washington who was on the seal of the Confederacy, uh, the George Washington whose statue uh, uh, Jefferson Davis took the oath of office next to, uh, on his birthday, February 22nd. I mean, th there were very deliberate attempts to link the Confederacy's fight for independence and freedom with George Washington's fight for independence and freedom. And at the same time, Abraham Lincoln uh, was pursuing Washington's birthday as a day of remembering the Constitution, the man who founded the Union, uh, the man who was willing to send federal troops out to confront rebels in Pennsylvania. Uh, so, we have two very different George Washingtons during the Civil War. And ultimately, you know, the side that wins the war gets to write a lot of the story. And, and Washington is remembered uh, primarily much more as president, as general, as constitutionalist. Um, but who knows if, if things had gone differently? We know there might be two Washingtons uh, that we all still talk about. I live next to Lincoln Park here in Capitol Hill, and there's a uh, the famous image of Lincoln standing above the emancipated uh, enslaved person, and right there on the podium next to Lincoln is the bust of Washington. Uh, so you're exactly right that, and that's an 1870s monument. That claim of Washington for the cause of the Union happens uh, right away, and before that, it was much more contested. Uh, we're coming into uh, to some final questions. Uh, we we have just a handful of minutes left. Uh, but Kathy Heath asked, asked a question that I, uh, it's the kind of question I asked uh, students, I used to ask students when I taught uh, quite all the time, was there a document that you used that made you say, oh, wow, I, I used to ask students all the time, what surprised you as you got into this? Um, was there a document that jumps out to you? Um, I mean, I, I think in terms of uh, sentimental value, um, there's a letter uh, between Martha Washington and Abigail Adams. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, Martha, especially after her husband passed away, um, you know, she didn't write a lot of these letters. It, it, a lot of it was done by Tobias Lear uh, or other secretaries. So for her to take the time to write, you know, this particular letter to Abigail Adams, and, and she says something to the effect of, you know, I, it's a pain that I'm feeling that I hope you never feel uh, to lose someone like this. And it, it's a very sentimental and, and warm letter. And, you know, I think because Martha burned the correspondence between her and George, a lot of people have just assumed that they had a distance uh, between them, that they, they didn't have a, a very loving marriage. Uh, but, you know, I, I think between Washington's letter uh, when he's taking command of the army in Boston and between that letter where she's talking about the pain and the anguish she feels upon losing him, 
I think it does offer a window into understanding her and George's relationship a little bit more. So um, with that, um, uh, the um, I, I see uh, Linda's uh, coming in. Actually, uh, uh, Co. Chris actually did ask a question that is right on these lines. Uh, why do you, why did she, uh, Mrs. Washington uh, why did Martha burn the letters? And, and I will note, by the way, we have no smoking gun uh, that says that she burned them. It, it's it makes sense uh, that she mm -hmm. burned them, uh, but there's no moment as as my uh, boss Doug Bradburn likes to point out. There's no moment where she says, "Today I burned all of." The general's letters. Uh, so uh, we like to hope that we'll stumble across uh, uh, some at some point. Although it's a it's a faint hope at this point. But why do you think? Uh, it obviously makes sense that uh, to mm -hmm. to um, uh, to conclude that they've been burned. Uh, why did she do that? Well, I mean that was common practice uh, in the 18th century uh, in marriages. You know, correspondence between husbands and wives was considered private, and all the more private when you have someone who is a national figure. Uh, you know, even Washington himself, uh, he writes in a letter to James McHenry that he says he only has one last building uh, that he wants to put up at Mount Vernon, and it's a building for his papers. Uh, mm -hmm. He thinks those might be of interest someday. I guess, again, he had the foresight. Um, and as it turns out, the Washington Library ended up being that building. Right. But, you know, for Martha, uh, yeah, okay, George, it's fine if you want to have your presidential papers and your military papers and your correspondence. If you want that to be open to people understanding you, that's fine. But, you know, when it involves her and their relationship and that intimacy, um, you know, Martha had to make that decision. And that was common practice for the, I don't think there was any, like you said, uh, there's not any grand conspiracy or anything like that. Um, but that would have been standard practice for the day. And I think especially, uh, you know, in a marriage between probably the most famous American uh, in the country and maybe the world, um, you know, sh there were probably things that she wanted to keep between them and they should be. Well, this has been a, a fascinating conversation. I, I, I thank you so much for, for telling us the story. Uh, I know that actually a good, uh, a, a good number of the members of, of our governing board, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, have been tuning in from their homes tonight. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for telling us the story of the tomb that they continue to preserve. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed every second of this. Uh, we will have a winner uh, of, of a copy of your book soon. Uh, we also want to uh, really thank you uh, for this um, uh, coming in in these, these circumstances. I hope you're, you and your family are doing well uh, and staying safe. Uh, and and we're, we all, all hope to have you back in Mount Vernon in person one day soon. Yeah, and, you know, it's it's been... Uh... Granted, I was I was looking forward to coming uh, to Mount Vernon and, uh, you know, sort of coming back to where things all began. But I mean, I, I think this just sort of this speaks to the power of who Washington was. I mean, he, he was able to connect people, uh, even if you never saw him, even if you never met him. Um, and, and I think that's part of his legacy that we still have today. And, and I hope that people got some insight to that tonight from the book talk. Then uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, we're uh, going to uh, uh, conclude tonight and uh, hopefully, again, see you at Mount Vernon soon. I, I know that you have a busy schedule of, of similar online events with the White House Historical Association. Uh, we're all uh, transforming into this new format. Uh, but thanks for making this particular uh, book event such a great success for us. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much.